What is up, everybody? Welcome back to the Get Elevated podcast. It is your host, Ellie, a.k.a. Ellie Talks Money. And I am super excited to bring you guys another episode. You guys are going to love this one. The guests just keep getting better and better. And you guys know here on the show, it is always my goal to give you guys a real view into entrepreneurship and the stories of the entrepreneurs behind some of these businesses that you guys all know really well, because I'm always wanting to encourage you guys to start and scale your business, no matter where you're starting from. If these people can do it, so can you. So grab your notebook, grab a pen, and let's get into these gems. Listen, everything you need to change your life is already within you. You need to believe that. It has to work or it has to work. You got this. Scale your business, make more money, create your best life, and let's get elevated. Welcome to the podcast. All right, y'all. Welcome back in. So today's guest This is really going to blow your guys' mind. So you guys know I'm on the Thinkific platform, right? You guys have seen me talk about Thinkific. You've enrolled in my classes in the academy on Thinkific. And it's so funny how things line up because today we're actually going to be talking to Greg Smith, who is the CEO, founder, and and mess cleaner upper (laughs) at Thinkific. So we're super excited to bring him in. And Greg, tell everybody who you are. Hi, Ellie. Really a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for having me on your show. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us and listening in. Hopefully I can give uh, lots of value to you all here today. Uh, yeah, I, I, I work at Thinkific, love what I do there, get to help so many entrepreneurs create their own businesses, doing what they love. And really what I'm about and what we're about here is um, helping people who have some knowledge, passion, expertise, uh, and, uh, and, or skill, and they want to go share it with others, have a positive impact doing it and make a living and build a business around that. And, uh, and that's what we're here to help people for. And that's what gets me excited and up every day. I love that. I absolutely love that. So I want to take us back a few years and before starting Thinkific, what was your first business? Was this your first go in entrepreneurship with Thinkific or did you start with some other things first? I, I may have had a few dozen before this, uh, so we don't need to go through all. The first one, I was probably, I don't know, eight or nine or 10 or something. And we did mm. uh, this thing, uh, my friend and I called it Snowbird Mountain. And we were uh, built these marble tracks, racing marbles down a dirt hill in someone's backyard. And then we would go buy uh, candy and other goodies at, at Costco and sell them to the local kids. And uh, they would come and race their marbles down the hill and buy candy on the sidelines. <laughs> I love it. Wow. So that was the, that was what started it all. So, at, you know, at eight or nine, entrepreneurship was already kind of in you from that age. And do you feel like yeah. this kind of started with your parents or were your parents entrepreneurs too? Um, not strictly. My dad's a doctor. My mom's a nurse, uh, but <laughs> my uh, I think always they always did have some entrepreneurial uh, ideas or ventures. I, my dad always had something going in the garage, whether it was like trying to build a flying car or um, worm farming or some yeah. other or some medical device that he was working on inventing. So it probably a lot of it came there. Yeah. So tell me a little bit, what was one business that you had that really taught you some of the biggest lessons that then ended up leading you into Thinkific? I mean, you know, one of the interesting ones, uh, well, maybe over a course of a few learning about co-founder relationships. So Mm -hmm. had some really interesting co-founder relationships, have co-founders in this business in in Thinkific. Um, And, you know, just some people I worked with that really taught me how I appreciated being treated as a co-founder and how important that could be to building a business. And you don't always need one, but I remember one where I was building it with a lawyer friend of mine and it was going okay, but it wasn't, it was obvious it wasn't going to turn into something huge. And we'd worked on it for about a year together and it was becoming apparent he was doing most of the work. And Mm -hmm. he said, Hey, I want to buy you out. And I said, you know what? You do most of the work these days. Anyway, I did a bunch at the beginning, but you just take it. You don't need to buy me out for anything. And so he's like, okay, great. I really appreciate that. That's awesome. Cause we don't have a lot of money right now. So he took it, kept building it. And then he came back three years later, the business started to make good, decent money. And he came and then just cut me a check at that point and bought me out. And, you know, I wasn't waiting for it. Wasn't looking for it. Didn't expect it, but it was just this 
high level of mutual trust and respect where you didn't have to battle over thing, anything and you got to really focus on building the business. And that was, uh, I think that's a co-founder relationships are definitely critical. If you're going to have them, I think in a lot of ways, it's more important than a marriage. Yeah. I would agree. Wow. That's actually a really great story. And I have, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs in my community will ask, well, how do I know who's the right partner for my business? How do I go about finding the right person to start a business with? Because it is like going into a relationship. And so for you with your different co-founding relationships, what are some things you look for to assess like, okay, this is a person I can do this with? Yeah. So there's, there's definitely a lot of the person and Everybody is going to have a bit of different ways. One is, you know, what skills are they bringing that are different than your own? Mm -hmm. Do your core values align on how you want to build this around team and culture is a big one. Uh, and then I would say you, you do your best on the assessment and take some time on it. Um, but also think about the exit because it doesn't have to be a bad thing if you part ways, if you plan for it. And so as a lawyer, I was always thinking, okay, how could this end? You know, what, what should we do if it ends? And that, because if you get, let's say you're building something where you think it's going to take 10 years to be really successful. Uh, like I'm 11, almost 11 years in now at Thinkific and imagine your co-founder leaves two years in and you just split the shares 50, 50, you know, or ownership over it. What do you do? Do you want to have a big argument at that point? So thinking through a little bit at the early stages of, okay, one of these days, one of us is probably going to want to go our own way. How are we going to deal with that is a great way to keep a good relationship, you know, even after the fact. Um, and then the other thing I think is a lot of people are often looking for a technical co-founder. So if you are, I think, mm -hmm. um, or if, if you're looking for a co-founder who has a skill set you don't have, for me, that was software development. I was lucky it was my brother. Um, mm -hmm. But if it's not, if you're not, if you don't know the person well and know they have that skill set, find someone else to evaluate them right? Like mm -hmm. if you're hiring a developer to be your technical co-founder, have another super strong developer do some evaluation of that skill set before you kind of commit to that arrangement. Yeah. So that way you almost have the best of both worlds in starting this business. You you have your set of skills and, and I think that's really key because much of the time we'll go in looking for someone who's just like us, but that may not always be like the best equation actually to a successful business. You almost need your opposite in so many ways you know, in order to scale. So that's really good. I like that. So what I wanted to also ask you about is for, you know, you had some experience starting some businesses, getting out of some businesses, kind of trial and error before landing on Thinkific. For business owners that are at this place where they just started something, it didn't work, and they're mustering up the courage to start again, what could they do? Um, so sorry, they're just starting up, didn't work. Now they're mustering up the courage to start the next one. Yes. Yeah, I had to jump again to the next ship. <laughs> I, I think the <laughs> one, I, I think making sure you've got the energy. So if you, if you're not super excited and stoked about that next thing, take a break in between. Like I, I say, I've done maybe a dozen companies, but I went to school. I did two degrees. I worked as a yeah. lawyer. I did a whole, I traveled. I did a bunch of things in between to sort of re-energize. Sometimes I jumped one to the next, but mostly there was a break in between. And so I'd say if you're not feeling super excited and energized because there's going to be draining experiences, then wait, wait before you dive in. And then the other is just recognize that any of those setbacks are huge wins in terms of learning and experience. I don't think I could have been able to build Thinkific to where it's at today without all the failures or half successes or challenges and, and, um, um, partial wins or, or lessons that I had leading up to it. So take it as, you know, basically, uh, uh, some serious experience you have that you can apply to the next venture and, and remember to, to take it as experience and learn from it and apply it at the next go round. Yeah. And to keep your, keep your head up, right. Keep your chin up too. And just know that you learn those lessons for a reason. So I definitely want to ask you a little bit more about Thinkific. You know, my audience knows the great relationship I have with you guys. We have so many students enrolled in the classes there. So I'm excited. What are, you, what are some of your favorite things about the company you built? What, what do you love about Thinkific? Oh yeah. A lot of things, <laughs> but <laughs> naturally at its core, if, if you ask me sort of like the why behind the why behind the why of all of it is we get to make people's dreams comes true. Right. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of people like 
and the key people that I really love serving and, and helping their dreams come true is first of all, our customers, they get to take that passion they have, have a positive impact on others and build a business doing it. And every time I see someone do that, uh, and it's life-changing for them, you know, that's, that's the reason I'm, I'm excited to be in every day. So that, that's something I absolutely love about it. Um, another one I think is the people they impact. So we have this really cool, um, sort of ripple effect in our business where we help the entrepreneur and the entrepreneur shares with their students, their customers, and, and that has this huge, massive ripple effect. And through us, because we've helped ten, tens of thousands of entrepreneurs and they've helped millions or hundreds of millions of students might be hundreds of millions now. Um, yeah. It's that amazing ripple effect that we get to have. And then a third really is the team is I absolutely love coming to work with the team. We have an amazing culture um, a very different people, different backgrounds. It's definitely yeah. not all the same, um, but that's part of what makes it really cool to be a part of this. And then watching their own sort of career aspirations come to life is another way we get to make people's dreams come true. So all of that together um, gets me pretty excited. That's so good. And having that, I can see your excitement. Every time I talk to anyone at the team at Thinkific, everyone's just ready and happy. I'm like, this is great. You know, it really does feel like you get a good support system there. I love that. So connected to that, and the reason I wanted to ask you about some of your favorite things about the company you've built is it seems like Thinkific also has really clear values and really clear brand values. And when building a business, you know, a lot of the time, I know my students and entrepreneurs in general will kind of go straight to the strategies, the numbers, the et cetera. And that's important, but we may sometimes skip over the actual what is this business going to do to solve people's problems, to change their lives? And what are some of the values our company is built on? So how did you go about building some of these core values that you now have for Thinkific and that you, you know, your team lives by, or at least works by? So I think um, there, if I separate out sort of the mission and the vision and why we come in and what we want to do, which is really helping those entrepreneurs, you've got a knowledge and a passion, you want to have an impact, we want to make you successful and make sure you grow your business and earn revenues. That's our mission. That was sort of what we set out to do. And that evolved a little, but it was always really at the core of what we wanted to do. And I think having a clear sense of the impact you want to have, the kind of people you want to help and um, is great. And then how you help them can evolve. Today, yes. we're on the internet. 10 years from now, maybe it's all virtual or augmented reality. The tools to me don't matter as much as the impact we get to have. Mm -hmm. Then you switch over to core values. I think that is something fundamentally different. That to me is, and I know that's what you asked about, that is something that is much more in your DNA. So for us, mm -hmm. we waited till we were maybe 13 to 15 people. We read a book called uh, Scaling Up, the Rockefeller Habits. And then from that and a few others learned how to put our, our core values together. And really it was about, this is not aspirational. It's not the kind of people or the kind of culture we want to have. It is, what are we? We're here, we've been operating for a few years now. We've got a team, the initial team is here. We're excited about what we're doing. Let's go around and talk to everyone and figure out why they come, why they love it, what's amazing. We went through a history of like people who really, worked well within the team and and those who didn't. And that helped us draw the differences of what do we want to be? What do we not want to be? Uh, and then we wrote that down, distilled it down to some core values and then shared it. And, and then the key thing from that point is to live it in a way that it's, um, it, it must be part of every, of a lot of the things you do. So it's built into how we hire, how we fire, how we promote, how we compensate, um, how we celebrate each other and our wins, how we treat our customers uh, is really built into everything we do. Wow, that's super key. And, and I love that you mentioned a part of coming up with those core values was actually done as a team. It's not necessarily something you do by yourself, but it's more of now that we're all here together, like, what does this look like? What are we doing? What what values are we already operating by? And really just documenting that. I think that's key. And I would feel like that is a an element that becomes a huge part of the lifeline of a business. And it may be difficult to get to 10, 20 years without core values. Would you agree? Yeah, it um it certainly it, it's certainly critical. And I'd say it is amazing. I even looking back now, I knew it was important when we did it, but now looking back, it's very apparent how powerful it is in that there were actually a, one or two things we left out of our core values when we were formulating them that we're seeing now, well, that's 
kind of a problem that we didn't capture that because it was the weird thing. It was one of the ones was, um, it was so core to what we were doing, uh, that we just kind of assumed it and, and brushed over it. And so going back and working that back in has been critical. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they're, they're amazingly powerful and they will define what you create as a team and a culture and a company. Yeah. And creating something that lives beyond you, you know, I think what I love most about think if they can just businesses that exist outside of an individual is those core values will stay even when it's not you as the CEO anymore, or when there's someone else who's at the top because it becomes this entity. And so I definitely want to ask kind of connected to that, that can be a hard step, right? Separating you as the owner or co-founder of the business from the business that you've created. And if you can kind of conceptualize what I'm asking, like how can business owners do that a little better? How can business owners create something that can exist outside of themselves versus working so much in the business and less on the business, you know? Yeah. And and I think it's baby steps. It's steps along the way. And, um, you know, one step in that direction is giving away your Legos. Uh, mm. And, and <laughs> um, the way I like to look, which really it's, it's delegating, it's sharing responsibility. And the way I like to look at it is uh, it is about um, giving people the tools and the guidance and the operating, like what, what is important, like core values. Uh, but there could be other things like for me, looking at the return on investment of any activity that we take. So it's like, Hey, we're going to write a blog post. Okay. Well, how long is it going to take and how many are going to people read it? That's a basic ROI analysis right now there. Yeah. Like how long are we putting into it? What's the benefit we're getting out of it? Or what will the customers get out of it? it's one of the principles I use in making decisions. And so trying to teach the team that means that I don't need to be in the room because I know they're going to think about the ROI. So step one in that whole process to me is learning to give away your Legos, but doing it responsibly. It's not and giving away your Legos just means delegating, but it's, it's not abdication, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, which means to give someone something and then just hope it goes well and step back. And, you know, there, to me, there's no hands off and there's right. no micromanagement you, you got to create the rules and systems for people to be successful and check in enough, uh, depending on their maturity of the task or the role. So if, if you're sharing with someone, if someone's going to take over something from you and they've never done it before, you probably need to be working with them pretty hands-on and regularly until they've got it figured out. If they're, if you've hired someone who's super experienced in this, maybe even more than you, then you're probably just checking in. How's it going? Let's, yeah. let's make sure we're aligned on what success looks like and let's check in along the way. And for one person, you could have different ways of managing them depending on the task. And so to me, the whole process there of, you know, being able to have more um, area of impact across your business and bring in more people and have more amazing things happen that you don't have to direct and control comes yeah. down to that amazing ability to lead and manage by delegating to the right level, to the right people and managing at the right level. And communication too. I love what you said that it's not abdication because I think a lot of the time when we think of delegating, it's just like, okay, just do this. Let me just, just take the task and just do it. But truly, like you said, you have the confidence to not be present for every meeting because you know the team already understands to almost go down this internal checklist because of the communication you've had with them in order to do that. So that's a really big gem, y'all. That's a really big gem. So I wanted to ask you too, you know, let's talk about competition, right? In business, there's nothing new under the sun, essentially, right? Anything we come out and create probably either already exists in some way, shape, or form, or it's been done. And so I'm sure when you created Thinkific, there might have been other models out that were similar. How did you go about studying what was on the landscape and figuring out, and, and also having the confidence to create something that you knew was kind of already out there. So interesting thing for me on competition, I think, is if you if you don't have competition, if you're really looking at what you're doing and saying, I don't have any competitors, some people, I've seen people sort of give investor pitches, like that's a good thing. It's not a good thing. It means either you haven't done the work and, and there's competition and you're just blind to it, mm. or there's probably no market for what you're doing. Now, sometimes there is something, but even if you're the first one to make an electric car, 
uh, your competition is gas powered cars, right? Yeah. And, and, and that's a big comp competitive element. So uh, competition is good because it validates to some extent that there is a market and an audience there, and it helps you show how you're going to differentiate. Another thing I think about it is comparison is the death of joy. So be careful not to compare yourself too much to the competition along the way. It can really rob you of the joy, figure out what you're, it is good to do the analysis. Um, and understand that and check back in with it. But most for the most part, you want to figure out what you're going to be super passionate about and really good at, and that should be differentiated. And then just lean into that as opposed to always worrying about what others are doing. Um, when we got started, interestingly enough, so when we were starting, I actually started before we started Thinkific, I was teaching and tutoring on the LSAT, a law school admissions test, wanted yeah. to create my own course. And we actually went looking. I didn't want to build Thinkific. We wanted to find something that existed and nothing really did. We found at least that we could find. There were marketplaces. So kind of like mm -hmm. Udemy, Masterclass, Coursera, not those, but but similar ones existed. Uh, you could build your own with WordPress. You could build your own if you were a software developer, but nothing that was sort of off the shelf, my site, my brand, my content, uh, my audience, my data, my revenue, uh, my brand, um, and mm -hmm. so we actually set out to, to build it. Now, as we got started, obviously co competitors popped up and there were others in the space. Uh, and then we learned from that and adjusted and really focused in our strategy. Um, but when we got started, we didn't see a lot. Now, that's not to say we didn't have competition. It, it wasn't just doing exactly what we were doing. There were other ways of solving the problem. We definitely had uh, competition like the marketplaces, like build it yourself or do it yourself solutions. Mm -hmm. Wow. I love that. I'm taking notes here. And I think what you mentioned is really key in not, and I totally agree because this is a quote I live by that comparison is the thief of joy. And the more we kind of fall down that vortex, it's so hard to get out. Um, and that's something I tell my audience all the time. It's very, it's a good thing to identify the competition. In fact, it's your responsibility, but it's not to make you feel less about yourself. In fact, it's to help you see okay, this is what they're doing, but here's where some gaps are, right? Maybe here's some areas that I can fill in with my model and retrieve some new or create some new customers who may have been looking for these gaps to be filled. And now here we are to be the ones to fill them. Definitely. Yeah. And one more thing I would throw in on the competitive side, because I love this idea and the and a book around it is there's a great book called What is Strategy by Joan Magretta, and it's based on Michael Porter's teachings. And Porter is quite dense, um, yes. <laughs> heavy reading. I even struggle with it, and I've read a lot of dense legal texts. Um, but uh, Joan Magretta does an amazing picture book summary called What is Strategy? Like so fun that it's got roller coasters and bears and animals. Um, you know, you can read it in an afternoon. Uh, and so much fun. My four-year-old son took it to daycare, the book to show off to his class. He was excited about it. So it's a fun little picture book on strategy, but it gets into competition. And I think the underlying way to look at competitive analysis or competition is how are you different? How are you differentiated? It's not about being better, faster. You know, it's not about being the same, but better. It's about how are you, um, how, are, how are you different and special? Mm, I love that. And I, because Porter is extremely dense, almost so much that it's a little scary and very intimidating. But I had not heard yet of what is strategy. So y'all, that's what we need to add to our reading list. That's good. That's really good. I like that. Um, and I want to double back to what you mentioned earlier about seeing some investor pitches where they try to highlight, oh, there's no competition. We're the only one in the space. And it's kind of like, mm, that's not necessarily going to get you get you the funding. And so connected to that, what can business owners do in those situations, right, where they're pitching to a room of investors? What do you think and what have you found success in as things you can highlight in your pitch to get the yes? Yeah. So there's a lot of great resources out there, but I see there. I'll hi so I'll highlight a few of the things I think I see that are a bit different than what others talk about. There's some really good resources um, out there on sort of investor decks, and you can just search for for. Um, standards around that. If you're in the software space, I like what Dan Martell's put together around how to pitch investors. But some of the things I see that I think are a bit different is fundamentally, I look at it as you're telling a story with data and, and you want to, the date, the story is how you want to inspire people. It's the thing you're passionate about. It's the mission, the vision, the, the journey that you're on, the impact you want to have in the world, the people you're going to help. 
and then you back it up with data. And um, you can't forget to bring either one of those elements to the to the story. And this goes, look, this goes, goes to any pitch, you know, even if you're, I think, pitching a customer, if you're pitching a um, partner, but especially for investors. So the more you can align your data and your story, and I don't mean falsely, but just, you know, make sure they line up. Um, and that, for me, that often means starting with the story we're telling, um, looking at the data, and if necessary, you know, even adjusting, hopefully you've got a story that aligns with your strategy that's built on your data, but it kind of depends on how mature you are in this process, but making sure your data backs up your story and your story aligns with the data. And then what I like to do, which is a little bit counter to a lot of the pitches I see is I, the first half at least of my pitch story is facts because mm. almost every deck I see starts with a big up and to the right chart of all the money that this investor is going to earn or the company is going to earn, but it's all future looking. So in my decks, the first half of the deck at least um, is all historical looking. It's only facts. Mm. And it is, and the reason is if the first thing you show an investor, they're trained to be critical. They're trained they're They think they've been, they've been not lied to, but they've been sold things that are unproven so much that the first time you show them a slide, they're thinking, how do I criticize and tear this apart? What is wrong here? Mm -hmm. But if you open with, here's a fact, here's a fact, here's a fact, here's a fact, well, you're telling a story and then you say, okay, so that's all true. Then they know it's true. They're starting to sort of put aside their disbelief. Now you can go into like, okay, let's look to the future, right? Um, I find that approach um, works quite well. Just puts people in a different mindset of accepting what you're saying uh, rather than trying to look and poke holes in it right out of the gate. Yeah, I can definitely imagine that it, it probably brings their guard down a little because you're presenting them with all this truth. So then you can kind of go in and say, now let's imagine this next world, right? This this next option. Ooh, that's, that's very juicy and good. I like that. All right, you guys. So grab a water, open to a new page in your notebook. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Hey, future millionaires, thank you so much for tuning in to Get Elevated, my live coaching and podcast show. I absolutely love sharing this value with you, and I want to make sure that you're tapped in to all the other resources I provide for you here on the channel, as well as in my academy, elevatedacademy.com. You guys know that I'm so passionate about helping you start and scale your businesses online, build business credit, get access to funding, and just overall creating multiple income streams. So I want to make sure that you are tapped into my wealth masterclass. You can get the link to that down below or by going to elevatedacademy.com and enroll ASAP. I'll see you guys in the masterclass. Bye. All right, you guys, welcome back. Super, super excited to continue the conversation with Greg. So before our break, we were talking about your kind of hack and pro tip when you are getting, when you're presenting to investors is instead of leading with this is how much money you're going to make instead leading with, hey, here's the facts and the facts show X, Y, Z, which kind of lets their guard down a bit and gives you the opportunity to then tell this story. And so connected to that, once you go into telling the story and then you are presenting it with future, you know, how much they could make, how do you go into calculating that? Like, how do you pro project on something that is new, that is a first time invention, you know, how do you come up with kind of the data to back that up if it's something that hasn't existed before your company? Yeah. So ideally it, it depends. And this is, this is something with pitching is when I was starting out, uh, I'd with, with Thinkific, I'd say one of the mistakes and, and maybe poor advice that we were given was to start pitching investors from day one. And, you know, I mean, you can, we learned from doing it for sure, but it's not a great use of your time when you're just getting started. And I think, yeah. you know, barring the friends and family or the occasional angel investor who really believes in what you're doing, you're not going to find a lot of investment until you have some results. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when I talk about share, you know, starting with facts, it, it, a lot of it can be, some of it can be, if, if you have no results, it can be, what is the size of the market? How many of these kind of customers are there? What are some competitors doing in this space? And what are their results? Because of a competitor being successful is an indication that at least there's a market where you can be successful. Things like that are facts. Um, what we opened with, and actually, if you just Google Thinkific investors uh, or go to investors.thinkific.com, you can find our pitch decks. Um, 
And so you can look at examples of this, uh, but um, we, especially our IPO presentation, um, mm -hmm. but uh, if you, what you'll see is we open with our historical results and we walk through the results that we've already delivered. And so that's ideal because you're just saying, hey, look, I'm just going to walk you through everything that's already happened in this company. Here's how much how, here's our revenue growth since we started, or here's our customer growth, or here's some testimonials we have from customers. So the more you can look at some historical things you've delivered before you jump to the future. Once you start jumping to the future, uh, that's great. And you should do that. And you should project what the opportunity, and then what, what the investors will test is your assumptions. So you're going to say, I think we can make a million dollars next year. And they're going to say, what are the assumptions? They're going to want to understand, okay, and what are your assumptions upon which that is based? And so that might be, look, I think I'm going to sell, each customer is going to pay us $1,000 and I can get 1,000 customers. Great, there's a million in revenue. Now we're going to say, okay, how can you assume that they'll pay 1,000? How can you assume that you can find 1,000? You're going to say, well, you know, we've already got 10,000 on our list and we typically convert at 10%. Okay, great. Now I've got to a thousand customers. Why will they pay a thousand bucks? Well, we ran a test campaign last month and 10% of them were willing to pay a thousand bucks. So now you're starting to develop the assumptions behind your model and you should be able to defend it. And when they say, why this, why that, why this? So that also means keep the model simple. Um, mm -hmm. I love to build really complicated spreadsheets and models. I would say, keep your assumptions simple. Um, a model that has lots and lots of assumptions to get to your future uh, is often more riddled with risk and uncertainty than one that just has a few key, the most important things that if you if you hit these, if you change these numbers, it will work. Stick to that. It'll make a simpler model that you can defend more easily. Mm, I love that because, you know, back in school, we always go by the KISS model, you know, keep it simple, keep it right. <laughs> Um, and it's good to know that even in those situations, that that can really work. And, you know, I'm, I'm asking you all these questions about investing. I'm super passionate about it because a huge part of the academy is teaching um, business owners, particularly women business owners, how they can get funding. You know, when we look at the landscape, women business owners don't always receive as much funding as other groups. And so we want to, at the academy, help to level that out a bit. So where do you find these investors to pitch to? Like, is it a Google search? Is it relationship based? What can, you know, a newer entrepreneur or one who's ready for this do to maybe find the right investors to present their idea to? Yeah. I mean, one exciting thing is we're seeing more and more angels actually, or VCs focus on um, women, people of color, uh, backbone angels, uh, Canadian group, I think is, um, uh, is doing exactly this. So you can find some of those groups and then, uh, that can be a, a foot in the door. I would find generally with investors, an introduction from a founder they've worked with is your ideal in, right? If, if someone mm -hmm. asked me for an introduction to my investors and I'm willing to give it, um, uh, my investors will pretty much always pick up the phone and give them their full attention. So uh, because I've delivered exceptional results for my investors, and so they trust my judgment on this stuff. So mm -hmm. your ideal in the door is to get an introduction to a founder, but I would say do a bit of research first in that don't ask for an introduction uh, to an investor that has no interest in your kind of business model. So right. most investors will publish the kind of businesses they'll invest in figure out which ones are there, then look at the kind of companies they've invested in, figure out if you know someone there, ask for an intro. You can always go for the cold cold message. That's fine. Nothing wrong with that. I've done plenty of that. Um, yeah. But warm introductions, like most scenarios, work a lot better. Yeah, because of the fact that there's already kind of that relationship there, which is key. You know, one thing about that I've learned so much in business is your network is definitely your net worth or can at least be a huge representation of that. And I think sometimes as business owners, when we start these things, it can kind of feel like you may be on an island and you may be the only one in your immediate circle who is doing these things, but stepping outside of that and going to intentionally look for people that have already gone down this path or maybe have held the hand of someone who's gone down the path is so key to success. Yeah. Yeah. And, but I would say if you can't get an intro and it looks like a great investor, don't let that stop you from doing a quick cold email. Just give them, yeah. you know, three bullet points of why they might want to talk to you about this. Yeah. Ooh, that just makes it so accessible. I, I really love that. It makes me super excited because so many business owners really 
really need that. So, you know, now you've, Thinkific is huge, right? We all know about Thinkific. And one of the things I definitely want to touch on just a little bit is, you know, how do you scale, right? And we've, we've, we've talked about this in segments throughout this interview, but thinking about, you know, what was your first hire in the business? I know you had a co-founder, but who was, who was like the first person you brought on and how did you come to that decision? First hire was a, a, a guy named Eugene, who was a designer, a product designer, but he designed everything for us, designed our website, designed the product, designed the quizzes within the wow. product. Um, and so he was the first person who came on and, and uh, you know, we looked around, it was myself who was more on the business side, my brother, who's good at marketing and at software development. And, um, uh, and then neither of us were great at my brother can do a decent amount of design, but we needed help on the design side. And, mm -hmm. uh, and Eugene came in who was by far better than both of us. So that was our first hire. And then I think our second hire might've been a designer as well. And, you know, so mm -hmm. we definitely needed help on the design side. I think three of the first six hires were designers. So, so <laughs> but it was really just looking like, where's the gap? Where can we get the maximum return on bringing someone in and thinking that through? Um, and then, yeah, that, so starting to grow your team is certainly a key way of scaling, just making sure that you're getting a good uh, return on that investment. Yeah. And really outlining, if you are going to bring someone into the team, what are all the tasks that they're going to do? And then what is the ROI for those tasks? So I really agree with what you said earlier, because, you know, myself, when I started my business in 2020, going into 2021, it was just me. And now I have a team of eight. And a huge, you know, which is, you know, I'm getting there. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Yeah. So, but a huge thing I always look at is, okay, if I'm going to bring in an individual, what are all the tasks they're going to do? And how do these relate overall to the bottom line, right? Because what we don't want to do is bring in all these people and it's actually making revenue go down because they're not adding to what should be making sales go up. Um, so that's a, a definitely a key strategy. Did you ever have any kind of hesitation or nerves to make your hundredth higher or, you know, with Thinkific and grow so big? Yeah, all the time. I mean, we're, we're, uh, 380 something today and, um, oh my God. Uh, yeah, adding, adding people. I mean, it, it's a huge decision every, even today, adding one more person to the team is always a big decision because if you get it wrong, the cost is quite significant. Um, for them, for you, for your coworkers who are around them, for the company in a variety of ways. And so I think it's one of those decisions where you really, like they say, you know, hire fast or sorry, hire slow, fire fast. Um, I think it's, it's being very careful mm -hmm. and analytical and as, you know, um, process and scientific oriented, we use a process called top grading that's been modified by us uh, to, to really ensure we do the best we can on the hiring front. Um, because whether it's your first or your 400th hire, it, it really does. It's a big decision. It makes a big difference. Yeah. And it's not something to be taken lightly. What's top grading? Is that a book? Yeah. So there's a book, uh, the book I would suggest around it is called, um, who W H O by G H smart. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it goes through, uh, basically how to hire and, and walks you through a really clear system on how to do it. And you can tweak it and modify it for your own. You know, some people think it's a bit too intense. So there's ways to sort of dial it back and, and make it easier to, to manage. Um, but, uh, but, but the principles in it are amazing. Yeah, that's a good one. I'm definitely going to write that down. So speaking of books, what is a book you're reading right now? And then what would you say are your top five favorite books specifically kind of around entrepreneurship and business. So you don't want my science fiction and fantasy ones. <laughs> <laughs> Ready player one and, uh, right, wise all the good. and yeah, no, <laughs> um, look, I love that. What is strategy by Joe Magretta. I love Michael Porter as much as it can be dense. I haven't gone through all this stuff. I'm a huge fan of Jim Collins, read everything he's produced except for maybe one little one. Um, so a good place to start on Jim Collins, actually, there's a tiny little 52 page mini book, um, called turning the flywheel. Uh, mm -hmm. and it actually covers a lot of the key concepts across his other books. Um, and then, uh, more re recently, better, simpler strategy, uh, I think is a great look. It's, it's probably a bit more of an analytical numerical look at things like strategy, but I, I love it because really it, it, 
the simple thing to save you the time reading because it's a bigger one is just um, it's about focusing on delivering customer value and customer delight. And, mm. uh, you know, the more you focus on that, the better off everyone is um, as opposed to just leaning into how do I make more money? It's actually how do I do more for my customers? I like that. I wrote that down. Better, simpler strategy. And have you read that book, Who Not How? Uh, I have not. No, I've heard the name. No? Yeah, yeah. I've heard I, it's on my list now. Like it's on my shelf as the next grab. So I've heard good things about it. But you know, when you were mentioning how a few of your first hires were designers, it's it seems to be reflective of that concept in the book. Um, he teaches instead of trying to figure out how to do something, just find the who that you actually need to put in place. So could be a good option for scaling. Absolutely, awesome. So my last question for you is. If you were seated right before God today and he would give you anything that you asked for, no questions asked, no hesitations, what would you, what would you ask for? Right before God. Oh. Or if you could get a yes from like, if you asked for something and it was going to be in your lap right now, what would you ask for? Yeah. I mean, look, if it's, if it's, if you're asking that powerful a question, I, if I can't, you know, I, I'd be tempted to try and cheat and ask for, you know, a million wishes so I could keep asking for all sorts of good things, but, um, <laughs> I mean, hey, we said anything, that's, a but, one. that's how us business owners but, think. <laughs> but if we narrow down to one thing, the thing that, you know, out, I, I do what I do at think if I can love it, I have an amazing family health and all sorts of wonderful things. I, I would be looking for, um, environmental change. I think, mm -hmm. you know, when I look globally, if you're talking that kind of change power, it yeah. would be around environmental change. And, um, I mean, even for me personally, with the wealth I've generated, uh, and will from Thinkific, that's probably where all of it goes in the long run is, is what we can do environmentally. Um, cause all the other problems to me, um, will go away if we don't yeah. solve the environment, cause we'll probably all go away. <laughs> Yeah, I totally agree. You know, I'm here in LA and I grew up as a green gorilla. So yes, totally in alignment with that. If, if that doesn't get fixed, really nothing else matters if we really think about it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Greg, let everyone know where they can find you. How can they stay in touch and just any last words you'd like to share? Um, I, you know, to the entrepreneurs out there, it's not easy, but that's what makes it fun. So lean yeah. into the pain, the challenge, the learnings, the failure, um, and have a great time doing it. I recently, my daughter asked me, what does failure mean? She's seven, but she asked me this when she was five. And it was such wow. an amazing experience where I got to redefine the word for her as um, something where things don't go as you wanted them to, uh, but you get to learn from it. And it's been amazing to see her embrace this concept of failure as a positive thing in her life. So I'd encourage all of you to take a little of that away because we fail a ton as entrepreneurs uh, and yeah. uh, it's such an amazing opportunity to learn. It is. I actually really love that. I have four kids, eight, five, and my twins are three. So they haven't asked me that question yet, but we're, we might have to bring that up as a dinner conversation tonight. <laughs> It's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I do ask her every day, what's something you failed at? Because if, you, if you're not failing mm -hmm. at it, you know, you're not trying something difficult. Yeah. 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 That's good. She'll, she'll be, she'll be a CEO of something one day. That's awesome. <laughs> All right, she Greg. Can be well, whatever she wants. <laughs> whatever she wants. Thank you again so much for being on the podcast. You guys, that was such, such a good episode. I definitely want you to comment below. What was your biggest takeaway from this? And if we should do a part two, you know, we've had a couple guests come back for a part two. So if you guys want more and this was a great conversation, let me know. And yes, tag a friend, share with a friend, and I'll see you guys in the next episode. Bye. So if you want to be on the next episode of Get Elevated, or if you want to be in touch with me and the team, then you can email podcast at getelevated.com or find me on Instagram and email me at hello at ellietalksmoney.com. Either way, we cannot wait to have you on the show and have you apply to be a guest for a part of the live business coaching. I'll see you guys soon.